So, hello everyone. My name is Bengt Lennartson and uh, I will chair this uh, second plenary session of the CASE conference this year. So, uh, I think we have Professor Chi uh, connected by Zoom. And it's my privilege to uh, present uh, Professor Jian, Jian Jun Chi, or John Chi, uh, who holds the Caroline Stewart Chair at the famous School of Industrial and Systems Engineering at Georgia Tech. Uh, Professor Xi will talk about quality science for smart manufacturing in the era of data-driven automation. Uh, so Professor Xi has uh, got his PhD from University of Michigan, and his research is on integrating systems informatics advanced statistics, control theory, and data science for what? Manufacturing and service systems. He has a number of very prestigious rewards, which I will not uh, read all of them. I can just refer to his uh, very excellent biography on the homepage of the conference. But notably is that Professor Xi has four, his fellow for four societies. Uh, double ISE, ASME, ISI, and INFORMS. Very impressive. And Professor Xi is also a member of the National Academy of Engineering of USA. So you realize we have a very, very strong scientist who will give his talk to us this afternoon. So, Professor Xi, very welcome, and I hope you have heard what I've tried to say, and uh, we hope that you connect right now. Yes, okay. please. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, also it's uh, really an honor to come here to give a talk. I very much like to be there in person, but uh, for the reasons we all know, I cannot uh, travel and so I gave the talk in my basement. Uh, so today I'd like to share my opinion and uh, uh, on the topic of uh, quality science for smart manufacturing in the era of uh, data-driven automation. So in this talk, I'm going to briefly introduce quality science, especially in-process quality improvements concepts, and then briefly introduce smart manufacturing and the data-driven automation. And then I gave a few examples how data-driven automation can serve in-process quality improvements uh, with the different applications and the different methodologies. And finally, gave a summary. So what is the in-process quality improvements? This is a concept I proposed in uh, 1995 when I first interviewed uh, the factory job in industrial engineering. My own background was uh, automation. I got my bachelor master almost PhD in China with focus on automation, and then got my PhD in manufacturing in mechanical engineering in University of Michigan. So when I apply job in IE, I'm thinking about what I can do to uh, contribute to industrial engineering and with focus on quality. So in that time, I have this uh, interview slides. So this is the manufacturing process. So we start from design the manufacturing process, manufacturing system, and then manufacturing system operation to manufacturing product. And after we have product, we check the quality and then ship to the customer. So in this manufacturing system, there are several methodologies well developed and implemented in some time. One is the design experiments robust design, which try to design the manufacturing process system, robust to disturbance. Another one is statistic process control, which try to monitor the process, the sampling theory for the product, and focus on the product of the process. And also the total quality management, that means the quality control philosophy from the management aspects, try to take care of all manufacturing system. One thing I think is missing is what's happening during the manufacturing process. Because uh, a robust design cannot anticipate all the disturbance 
will happen in the manufacturing system. If we focus on SPC or sampling, total sampling, uh, acceptance sampling, the product already made if uh, some defects occurred. And the management focused on the human, the maximum aspects, but not necessarily the system. So what we are thinking is we should focus on the in-process cost improvements with the sensing automation capabilities during the manufacturing process. We try to do real-time defect prevention during the stage of manufacturing. So in-process cost improvements, IPQI, should focus on online monitoring, root cause diagnosis, and automatic compensation control. So this is IPQI. We try to promote. And what's the data-driven automation? So we all know the definition of automation, automatically control the operation of a device, a, a process, a system, by mechanical or electrical device that take place of uh, human labors. The smart manufacturing, which uh, emphasize uh, sensors, IoT, big data computing, uh, machine learning, and uh, focus on advanced, advanced manufacturing system uh, with cyber security, robotic automation, different algorithms, virtualization, and uh, data fusion and an analytics. So you can see smart manufacturing really provide uh, effective capabilities to achieve data-driven automation and to achieve high quality productivity, flexibility, and reduce the cost. So what's the difference between IPQI and the statistical quality control? For a given manufacturing system, the statistical quality control focuses on the product and the monitor the process in control, out of control. And the if out of control is the, depending on the operator, the engineer, the technician to close the loop to see what is the root cause, do the data analysis and take the actions. The data driven automation for in process quality improvements really uh, not only use the measurement from the product, but also use the sensing information during the manufacturing process. And based on the sensing of the product under the process, we do data analysis and based on the engineering model, try to do the optimization and the control and achieve automatic comp compensation and control to impact on the manufacturing system. So the IPQI emphasizes engineering-driven modeling data analysis to link the process sensing data information with the product quality characteristics. So this is a data-driven automation for IPQI. And then we say, is there a difference between machine automation, which uh, we all know uh, from uh, uh, MEEE, aerospace electrical engineering machine automation, compared with the data-driven automation for in-process quality improvements. I think we're all familiar with this uh, uh, diagram. So for a given machine automation, it's saying we have a machine which has the disturbance, and then we have a controller to control this based on the output or performance of this machine, we feed back and uh, to compensate. Uh, compared with the desired input, we compensate to the errors. So this kind of control can achieve the best or desired uh, force, temperature, speed, and so on. So this is a machine automation. What's the data-driven automation for IPQI? On top of this machine, what's the purpose of the machine? The machine in manufacturing is trying to fabricate product. So no matter what kind of automation of the machine and the machine control, we want to accomplish the best quality of the product. So the data-driven automation for IPQI is focused on the measurements of the quality of this one. So based on the quality measurements of the product, we have the sensing, sensing data and then feedback of quality information. And then based on this one, compare with engineering specifications. And then this close the loop and control the machine to achieve the best desired quality. So you can see the difference between conventional 
machine automation versus the data-driven automation for in-process cost improvements. So we say, because we have the new types of sensing, new types of uh, measurements, and new types of feedback control, the data-driven automation for IPQI demands fundamental research and development in modeling and control for quality improvements. So we make a comparison between conventional machine automation versus the data-driven automation from different aspects in the control point of view. So machine automation, data-driven automation for IPQI, if we compare the control inputs, it is pretty much the same. We want to control the machine. We have the digital signals to control both cases. However, the output variables are quite different. In typical machine automation, it's digital. In uh, data-driven uh, automation for IPQI, it's really heterogeneous. You can imagine when we measure the quality, it can be digital, it can be text, good, not good. It can, can be an image to measure the quality and it could be a video signal to measure the quality. So the output variable and uh, for both are quite different. The model, because of the data different, the model for uh, machine automation typically are uh, differential equation, uh, discrete uh, difference equation for this. But for uh, automation for IPQI is quite different. It's not well studied because uh, what kind of dynamics, what kind of measurements are quite different for quality aspects. Also talking about the data sampling frequencies for uh, Machine automation normally is a uniform sampling and a high frequency sampling. But for quality measurements, it's really quite mixed. Some of them really high frequency, high speed, high resolution. Some of them really like functional curve, or some of them is really low frequency and even offline measurements. Talking about the control algorithm, machine automation is well studied for many algorithms, PID control, adaptive control, robust, fuzzy, and so on. But for uh, automation for IPQI is really depending on what kind of data available and what kind of uh, measurements and the system dynamics, the model is quite different. And the talking about system characteristics, the machine automation is, uh, most of them are dynamic equations, dynamic system. And for quality control, it can be dynamic or static, and many times it's a mixed system. So data-driven automation for IPQI really raises lots of new challenges for modeling, prediction, control research, and the implementation. We say because of smart manufacturing uh, implementation, there are lots of uh, opportunities for us to do data-driven automation for IPQI. So there are many opportunities. First, the widely availability of uh, process sensing, product measurements due to the industrial IoT. So the data is widely available for process and the product. The system operations become more transparent so we can see what's going on. And also technical capabilities and the flexibility of individual machines uh, provide this opportunity. And more importantly, the advancement in data science, machine learning, and the computing capabilities provide this uh, opportunity. Also, there are lots of challenges if we try to do data-driven automation. One is uh, there are multiple engineering and the quality objectives. So top of the quality is not a single one. There are multiple ones. And also how to model relevant information for a given objective for the IPQI. So that's very important. And also manufacturing system typically have multiple stages, multiple machines work together to deliver the final product. So how to get the relevant information for a given objective from all stages of manufacturing system, that's really a challenge. And also try to get a trade-off between model control precision, the sensing capability and the quality specifications. And also the data is heterogeneous how to get the heterogeneous data to represent the material properties, the sensing signals, quality measurements, and uh, 
all those issues in modeling analysis and control. Also, for IPQI purpose, there's a lack of a unified model strategy to make close to real time or real time control for quality concern, quality issues. And uh, we have a very well developed education system, but talking the integration of data science, control theory, quality science, and the design manufacturing, that's a lacking. So we need to train next engineering development methodologies to integrate all those different pillars to serve in process quality improvement purpose. There are much more opportunity challenges uh, I will not talk now. So in order to make a success, I say these three pillars are very important. One is engineer domain knowledge, very important. Whatever process system we study, we should understand from the physics point of view, engineering point of view. And also we should have a background in data science. Data science broadly say statistics, computer science, signal processing, machine learning, and so on. And also we should have background in operational research, automation, control theory. So only these three pillars work together, we can do a good job in data-driven automation for in-process quality improvements. So here I gave a few examples to uh, talk about what's the data-driven automation for different manufacturing process and the different conditions and uh, how this is unique compared with the machine automation. The first one I'd like to discuss is a uh, stream of variation methodologies for multi-stage manufacturing with focus on data-driven automation only. So what's a multi-stage manufacturing system? So almost all manufacturing system are multi-stage. So from a car assembly, you can see the detailed parts, stamped parts assembled together become sub-assembly and add additional parts become another uh, sub-assembly and eventually become a car. So there are multiple assembly stations. Eventually we get the final product. Same thing for the uh, machining process, like an engine head. There are 24 machining stations to uh, from the casting block to final engine head. This is also multi-stage. We say 3D printing or additive manufacturing is also layer by layer. So you can see they print one layer, add another layer and further so this also multi-stage manufacturing and the uh, semiconductor manufacturing. There are multiple chambers to uh, multiple chambers, thousands of them to from beginning wafer to the final chips product is the multi-stage manufacturing. So for the multi-stage manufacturing, what's in common? There are many common issues. For example, variation propagation. So if you have I use the car as an example. So if there are some dimensional errors in the sub detail parts, when they assemble together, they may have a assembly error, dimensional error in the sub assembly. So with this uh, dimensional error, even all following manufacturing process are perfect. This error will propagate along the production line and eventually show up on the final product. So there's a variation and the variation propagation in multi-state manufacturing. Another thing is tolerance of sentences. So tolerance of sentences saying, I like the final car with this kind of dimensional error, smaller than this. So this kind of final assembly tolerance need to be allocated to each stage, each sub assembly and each detail parts. So this, uh, how to do this allocation and also to achieve such kind of a, a tolerance, what kind of tooling error, the fixed error in each sub-assembly station and in each stage need to be studied. So it's a tolerance sensitive problem. Another one, root cause diagnosis. So if something wrong, dimensional error in the final product, in which station, which part leading to the error, try to find the root causes. And also digital sensing. For a car assembly, there are 150 parts, about 100 assembly stations in which station measure what is digital sensing problem to use minimize number of sensor to maximize 
root cause diagnostic capabilities, and also critical station identification in terms of there are multiple stations, must be some of them is more critical to the final product. Some of them may be less critical. So how to identify this one during the design and do the optimization. The last one really talking about the data-driven automation for in multi-stage is the automatic compensation. This is saying in early stage manufacturing, the product is already not so good with errors. So when the parts already has errors in one of the assembly station, I mean, or multi-stage uh, intermediate station, what we can do in downstream stages, can we do some uh, adaptive tooling or tooling adjustment to make the final product not so bad through the automation compensation efforts? So this is something uh, I'd like to discuss briefly in this uh, introduction. So the basic concepts of and the model of SOV is for multi-stage manufacturing process like this. In stage K, we have the product quality features fabricated and represented as uh, XK. Before stage K, the quality features is XK minus one. And in stage K, we do something fabrication to impact on the quality. And also we may have the, uh, natural tolerance of fault errors introduced to impact on XK. So for this kind of uh, system, we use this uh, state-space model to model the deviation and the variation propagation. So you can see incoming deviation propagate to the next uh, stage. In this state, we do something impact on the quality with some natural variation of fault. In this stage, we measure some quality features through sensor placement, which is the design the CK, CK to measure, to get the measurement of YK with the measurement error. For most of us, we are familiar with the linear system or system theory. So you can see this is a state space equation or linear representation of uh, the system. So, however, this has a fundamental difference with uh, control theory, system theory we're familiar with. In control theory, K is time. In multi-stage manufacturing, K is the state, manufacturing stage or station. So in other words, in, in control theory, K is a time from zero to go to infinity and uh, from the uh, multi-stage K is uh, 10, 50, very complex, 100, is the final number. So many theories, uh, concept in control theory, like stability, observability, controllability, and so on, can be borrowed, but not exactly the same. We need to revisit. So uh, there are some fundamental issues. For the multi-stage manufacturing, we have studied the model for different manufacturing process, for assembly, for machining, for uh, uh, 3D models, for the variation propagation, and also complaint composite parts. For all those models, there are something in common is this model structure. And in this model, as I said earlier, XK is the quality features at stage K. AK is a deviation transformation from K minus one to K. BK is uh, fixture locators of uh, how this uh, uh, tooling impact on the quality. YK is measurement uh, quality measurements, and CK is uh, sensor placement information. WK assist measure, VK uh, measurement error. So with this kind of a model structure, we can see by using this uh, state-based model, we can impact on multi-stage process control by using system control theory and also advanced statistics. So we say the SOV model provides a solid foundation for system theory and uh, advanced statistics to be implemented in the multi-stage monitoring diagnosis control. So we go back to data-driven automation. This is a, a idea how to how this do this. So the multi-stage manufacturing, 
we can measure, we care about the final station, K, what is the quality? So we want to minimize the variability or deviation of the final quality by adjust the intermediate stage, UK, here. And uh, in order to do this, when the product fabricated up to station K, in this station K, we make a prediction of what final quality will look like if all these uh, stages are perfect. I mean, perfect based on the current quality uh, we obtain. So we make this prediction based on this uh, state-space model. So you can see, if I solve a difference equation at the station K, I can get Xn. And from Xn, I can get Yn prediction. So the key idea is uh, eight station K, all quality features up to station K can be obtained. We have the in situ sensors to measure the, the quality. And then we make a prediction of the final product at the stage N. And uh, also we make adjustment of tooling locators at UK, try to minimize the predicted quality. So this is a concept to do this. And we did a case study in uh, GM by using this uh, uh, for this part. And this one is they call C flex, really is a, a flexible robot. The tooling locators here, like uh, arrow here, can rotate and go up and down. So basically they can change the orientation. Originally, this C flex is designed in the tooling for different model of the product. But different model, like uh, in the same production line, they can change the position to fit different model. It's very precise, robust. But we say, if we can for large movements for different model, can we do some perturbation for the improve the quality, if incoming parts, incoming sub-assembly has error. So we start this one, each P here is the uh, flexible tooling. And uh, the measurement points are here. For this process, we can get a model, and then we use the concept we just said, mentioned. We try to get the final product measurements with a good quality, consider the uh, movements constraint of each uh, robots. <clears throat> so this is result for um, result control with the green color and the yellow color is after control for all those points. So basically you can see with data-driven automation, without additional efforts by use of in situ sensing and the actuator, we can improve the quality. Uh, by the way, all these examples I have a papers list here, and uh, uh, all these papers can be do uh, downloaded from my website. So we talk about this as a control problem. What are the open issues, or something need to be further studied? For example where to put sensors to study the observability, diagnosability issues, where to put actuators to make sure we can control the parts, how to consider the modeling error, the sensor error by using cautious control concepts for uncertainty management, and also how to consider the mixed serial parallel configurations of multi-stage, and how to integrate the control concepts into the tooling design, sensing layout, automation for multi-stage manufacturing. So there are rich information for uh, <clears throat> investigation for multi-stage manufacturing. Another example is uh, use machine learning try to enable shape control in the fuel sludge assembly pro problem. So what's a fuel sludge? So you can see for airplane, there are multiple parts, especially the center here. Each cylinder here is called as one fuel sludge. And this is one example of uh, fuel sludge. The fuel sludge assembly is a very challenging problem. So when two cylinders put together, the shape of the cylinder is not perfect because of a dimensional error. And then there'll be a gap. When there's a gap, there's a, take a lot of time depending on the incoming parts, 
how they do it and currently before we work with the, on the topic the company use uh, uh, menu shaming and adjustment you can see each here is uh, uh, push and pull locators they can push and pull to adjust the shape of this one manually there are lots of uh, challenges in this uh, practice first is the low efficiency it takes quite time to really make it right and not optimal you can make two fuse large through try and error make it fit but not optimally fit and also depend on highly skilled engineers very experienced to do a good job in this one so we talk about data driven automation so we propose these concepts so we have this fuse large auto measurement you can see one to 55 and then we put the actuators along the edge and then when we have an incoming fuse large coming in we use a laser measurement metrology to get the dimension of this and then we develop a model uh, we call the uh, stream variation model because uh, airplanes are also multi-stage uh, assembly process so we develop a model and then we do uh, the optimization and try to find the optimal force and the location of these actuators to make adjustment and based on the optimal force uh, adjustment we can make the two fuse large aligned and then do a verification use metrology and then we stop here i mean finish the job in order to do automatic optimal shape control the first task would be get a model so we use the sparse learning model collaboration to get such kind of model this as i said earlier depending on what kind of process you may have specific model for a call improvement purpose so with the support of the company we get all the details of the fabrication process of a fuel sludge what kind of material what kind of fabrics and so on with all this detailed information we can get a digital model of the fuel sludge fabrication process and with this one we try to study what are the optimal location and uh, the force to design the control strategy. So after we have this model, the first question is, if this model is good enough, so the company uh, work with us, I mean, to do a verification. So they get a real fuel sludge. And in this real fuel sludge, they put a um, uh, force applied to here. And then they measure the deformation of the uh, fuel sludge from a sensor, from a dial indicator. So they did the real experiments and we duplicate this one in our model and uh, we do the same. So we hope the measurement data in both cases, the same, so that'd be ideal. But the reality is when force is small, this is okay. When force increase, you can see the blue color, the model, and the real data, red color, not match very well. So that means some parameters in our model is not perfect. We need the model collaboration. And then we got a real challenge. The company only gave us eight fuselage uh, data for the experiments. They don't want to give us more. We cannot, we want, we want more, but they, they cannot do it. They don't give us. And, but we have more, parameters in the model for calibration. So how to deal with this one? In order to address this limited uh, samples with a uh, lot of parameters to be calibrated, we use this uh, sparse learning uh, concepts. So one thing is we define this a sensible variable identification. So what the concept of sensible? So for the sensible variable, we say in the you know, given model, I say there are three types of parameters. For well, given objective in this case is the deformation of the parts from the simulation and the experiments. Some parameters in the model have nothing to do with this. So this one set of parameters. Another one is the parameters. The parameters in this one is a pretty accurate already in the simulation model. The second one, accurate, precise. The third one is the variable is not accurate in the model, but also very important to the model accuracy, so the simulation result. 
So we call this a third one is a sensible variable. So the question is, how can we get a sensible variable and try to find the value? So we designed this uh, optimization problem. So from the phase of experiments, YP minus simulation results. So this one is a deviation between two, this uh, two. We want this as a zero, as small as possible. And also we have this penalty, the true value with the parameter value. I mean, the, the parameter in the simulation model between these two. So by solving this one, we can automatically find what is the sensible variable and what is the value. Why this can accomplish this? So you can see if a parameter have nothing to do with this uh, objective, so no matter what kind of value, doesn't matter. So it's uh, will not show up here. If a parameter is already precise, this minus the true value will be zero. So that's uh, not important. Only sensible variable important to this uh, deviation and also not accurate. By solving this one, we can find that value. Okay, this is uh, the idea of this uh, calibration. So by implementing this one, we do the calibration. We can see after calibration, it match pretty good. So we get this the modeling part. After we have the model, the next question is how to control it. In the first phase of the research, we put the uh, actuator equally, just like this, equal distance on the edge here. You may ask, why here? Why not on the top of this uh, say, uh, fuselage? This is uh, due to the sponsor's requirements. They said nothing can be above. Uh, slightly above the center line is okay, but not on the top. So we equal distance to put this one uh, to control it. So that's our first work. But this equal distance is not ideal because the incoming fuselage can be any shape, arbitrary shape, not a exactly like a circle. Because of this one, we are thinking if any arbitrary shape, maybe there's an optimal strategy to put the actuators on the peak or valley, certain position not equal, which can provide better control results with precision with less fault. That is uh, what we hope. So we talk about how to put the actuator layout and also uh, what control force. We tried use physical based model to model the fuselage. It does not work. We tried to use the design experiments to get uh, the surrogate model of this. Uh, this one is uh, not very effective. So basically we tried quite a few methods, probably take uh, one year also with different efforts to try to get this one. We cannot get it done. Finally, uh, Juan Du, uh, she is currently in Hong Kong uh, Science Technology University. So she learned this uh, sparse learning and formalized as a machine learning problem to solve this problem. So how this works? So this uh, incoming fuselage with different shapes, we have measurement points, and also we have uh, M, uh, available actuator positions means feasible conditions. And also uh, we have uh, M actuators available. This is the feasible position, this is the M available. Uh, how many number of actuators? So we formalize this optimization problem. This is a gap between two actuators. This one is the uh, incoming parts dimension, the shape of the incoming one. And uh, this weighting coefficients to see where it, uh, which one is more important. And this one shows the relationship between force applied, force applied to the actuator and the dimensional change. So this incoming one with the force applied altogether is a deviation after ship control. And this is actuator. And also the force should be within range cannot be too large, otherwise we will broken the fuselage. So with this optimization problem, we try to solve it and uh, transfer this one into this uh, sparse learning with uh, here, uh, uh, solve this optimization problem. And also we did uh, derivations basically saying, 
solving this optimization problem is the same as uh, last slide's model. They are one-to-one -one, uh, equivalent. So by solving this one, we can get F optimization result as a big vector. In this vector, there are non-zero item components and zero components. For zero components means this potential actuator position, we should not put actuator. For non-zero position, that is, we should put actuator and the value of that one is the false should be applied to the fuse large. So using this, uh, uh, solve this optimization problem, we can, uh, we can do a kind of a surrogate simulation. We generally, we have a 30, 20 fuel sludge, and each fuel sludge, we give 30 different combinations of actuator placement and try to solve the optimal solution. All this uh, shape of the fuel sludge, 20, we used in the simulation are the real dimension from the airplane uh, company. And here you can see, I mean, this cartoon shows a different uh, fuel sludge. The red dot is uh, actuator position for this. For uh, this uh, 30, uh, 20 fuel sludge, each one has 30 possible solutions. The red color I link together is the one optimization result we obtain from the uh, sparse learning. And this plot is a maximum deviation after control. Smaller is better. This one is the maximum force applied to the actuator. Also smaller is better. So you can see our result is better than other actuator compositions and can achieve higher precision. But given specific fuel sludge, you can see the equal distance uh, actuator placement versus sparse learning result. We can use less force to get more precise control result. So that's a uh, second example. Uh, we say how to do data-driven automation for quality improvements, in-process quality improvements. So the second example. Third example is, uh, I say physical-driven machine learning and modeling for multi-stage manufacturing process. <clears throat> This is, uh, in this uh, particular example, uh, we work on rolling process. For rolling process, there are like 50, 80 roller stations. That's multiple stage, right? And each station has uh, about 15 typical measurements, speed, time period, force, lubrication, cooling, and so on. And also the data is heterogeneous with uncertainty. And uh, also there are complex uh, interrelationships among the data. There is no mathematical model to link all these rolling stations with all these quality measurements and the process variables uh, before we work on this one. And also the cost and the energy loss due to the quality issues could be very high. I worked on rolling process for 22 years on the different problems. Almost all my funding come from Department of Energy because if we can reduce number of defects, 1%, 2%. That's a huge, huge number in terms of energy saving, the uh, pollution reduction, and so on. <clears throat> so it's a quality issue, but it really is an energy issue also. So for rolling process, you can see, we know what's the rolling layout. We know what's the, in each stage, what the variables we measure. And also from the physical knowledge, we kind of know how they interact. So from the physical layout, we can get the process variable, quality variable, the material properties, which one may interact. So what I'm saying, physical driven modeling. And then we have the operational data. With the operational data, we can further improve the model for this specific process. So based on these kind of efforts, we can have this uh, condition-based process control. This is a simplified uh, model of a rolling process. So we can have a uh, number of defects, I mean, the defects we care about. And then this is related with the speed, the material, the heat, and uh, so on, so the, the cooling, and so on. 
So with this kind of a probability model or causation model, we can do a lot of things. If defects occurred, we can use model to see which one has the other root cause. And also with the process variable available, before we have the final product, we can make a prediction. And also with the prediction, we may make adjustment on some variables which can be controlled to impact on the product. So this uh, causation-based process control is another example of uh, data-driven um, data automation to improve the quality. We work closely with a company called us OG Technology and uh, the hot eye is their product on this. So the way we work on this uh, rolling process is we work with a sensing company, get all the data from the steel mills, develop an algorithm. And then once the algorithm developed, the company will implement our results. By using this kind of uh, R&D strategy, uh, our results currently runs in more than 50 steel, uh, steel mills in more than 14 uh, countries, and also produce lots of uh, savings in terms of uh, cost of savings and uh, pollution reductions per year. <clears throat> so that was the example uh, use causation-based model. The next one I'd like to uh, discuss is uh, design of experiments-based, DOE-based automatic control. This work has been jointly with uh, Professor Jeff Wu, who is a really a world leader in design experiments on the topic. So we all, I showed this slide early. So this is the manufacturing process. Design experiments or robust design is really try to focus on how to make the product process design robust to the disturbance. Also, as I said early, SPC. And uh, SPC is uh, monitor the process, try to auto control, try to find the root cause. And automatic process control, same as uh, IPQI we propose, is in process what we can do to uh, improve this one. I said this already. And the things we like to propose is uh, reduce the variability of the product by combining this uh, three strategies to get design of experiments-based automatic, automatic process control, DOE-based APC. So what's the basic concepts of DOE-based APC? So you can see this one is uh, a system, system F, and uh, we have a system disturbance like here or here. And this, if we set, this is a system response. If uh, we set the response X equals to X1 here, you can see this is uh, if uh, the disturbance is here. We have a good response, small variability. If disturbance is here, we have a large variability of the response. So use in other words, if offline design, this uh, design experiments, we set to X1, sometimes it's pretty good, but if the variation understanding is not right, it's changed to here, this is not so good. However, if we can measure this uh, disturbance, sensing this disturbance, we set this one to X2. So you can see, if I set X, uh, X2, in this disturbance, the variability will be small. If here, the variability will be large. This gave us a motivation to say, if in line, in statu sensing, I can measure the disturbance where they are. Accordingly, I can put the setting variable to X1 or X2, this automatic control, right? X1 or X2, I can always get small variability in response. So this is the concept of DOE-based APC. From design experiments, we get this model. After I get this model, 
in situ, I try to get the noise variable or disturbance measurements. According to these measurements, I make adjustment of uh, X. So this uh, question is uh, how to get the model F and uh, how to measure the noise and how to do the control setting. So basically, we uh, use design experiments to get the model, use SPC to monitor the uh, noise variable or disturbance and use ABC to uh, control the process. The key idea to implement this one compared with conventional uh, design experiments is uh, have understanding of the manufacturing process noise factors have two. One is uh, not measurable noise. We should know the distribution and also measurable noise. We can react to this. And also from the design experiments, we can get the parameter of model beta. And based on this model and the noise, we can have a control strategy to change the setting of uh, this, uh, change the setting of the system. And also the control variable has two categories. One is the offline setting. We can only change it when we set up the system or online controllable variable U. So this is a framework of uh, DOE-based APC. You may ask when this DOE-based APC can be used. I like to say this one is quite broad. Whenever we have uh, design experiments can be used to get the model and some noise factors can be measured in line, in situ. And then some control factors can be adjusted in situ. With this concept, we can use DOE-based APC. Basically, we get the model from the model. We try to uh, get a control objective. We try to find offline setting variable, online setting variable with measurement the noise, measurable noise and the model parameters. So by solving this optimization problem, we can get this uh, control law like this. Uh, also, I'd like to introduce, uh, I mentioned this words before, cautious control. Uh, in the SOV, I mentioned cautious control. And here, I just explain what's cautious control. In uh, certainty equivalence control, the control action is uh, purely based on the estimation parameters or measurement uh, value. We treat them as a true value. So that's a certainty equivalence control. If the control law not only consider the estimation or sensing variable, but also consider the uncertainty, the variance or covariance of uh, parameter estimation, covariance of the measurement of the noise. And with this consideration, this uh, control law is called as a cautious control. Yeah, in other words, when we implement cautious control, we have a larger uncertainty and the model parameters or noise. The control action will be smaller. I mean, cultures. When this uh, uh, estimation or model, so the measurements very accurate, this term will be not so significant. And this cultures control will be closer to the certainty equivalence control. In many applications, um, we experience use cultures control can significantly uh, improve the robustness of the control results to the model and to the sensing variables. This is something. Uh, could be a very interesting if you work on data-driven uh, automation. <clears throat> so, oh, I, I run out of time. So this is an example, basically uh, injection molding, we get a DOE and we get a control strategy. And uh, you can see a comparison between automatic control with the lowest uh, dot and uh, automatic control without considering modeling error, not cautious, is the right one, you can see bumpy. And this is a robust design uh, results. And I, if I put a zoom of this, you can see uh, uh, considering error with the lower salon provides best result for the cautious control. And uh, without consider modeling error is a bumpy uh, results. Okay, I very quickly say a motivation only. 
on the image-based feedback control. This is uh, a very new uh, results uh, we, we work on. So we see in many manufacturing process, the quality measurements are image or video signal. So like in uh, semiconductor manufacturing, we have different variables, setting variables, and then we get this uh, letter graph uh, quality measurements, kind of an image uh, to see it's good, not good. Also for a uh, machining process, we can set different parameters impact on machining. And finally, we get this uh, cylinder is uh, cloud data. I mean, also kind of image data. The question is, how can we use this uh, uh, image or video signal as the feedback information to adjust the control variables of the machine setting of machine parameters to get the best result? This is very challenging because uh, high dimension and uh, it's a special temporal correlated structure of the quality measurements and also the system is uh, not IID. In order to do this, we do tensor-based time series modeling and analysis. This addressed two issues. The tensor-based will address high dimension and the special temporal correlation issue. And the time series will address non-IID problem. Okay, so we developed a modeling strategy and also we developed control strategy based on the tensor. And uh, so by using a mo uh, tensor-based model, we can significantly reduce the parameters to be estimated from this number to 3,000. And also, uh, okay, this is a modeling algorithm. You can see the paper. And also we can do the control by using this one, make the prediction close to the target, make adjustment on this uh, input parameters. We did a simulation study. Uh, so this one is without control. This one is with control, our strategy. And uh, so you can see, you can see this number here, this uh, 10 minus three power, this minus six. So with control strategy is uh, pretty good. We also tried this one in a simulator of a photo, photo lithograph. Uh, this one we developed jointly with uh, a major semiconductor manufacturing uh, company. So here we can make adjustment on the input. This is the response. You can see all these kinds of more errors. Error is a zero is uh, the best quality. And the error is large is uh, not good uh, alignments bad quality. And this case the study results. This is a without control. This one is with control. And I show you the, I mean, here without control, you can see the arrows always bumpy. I mean, one way for after another. This one, you cannot see anything because uh, uh, in the simulation, the error is so small, you, you cannot see this anymore. <clears throat> Uh, so this one is without control, this with control. Okay. I just say one more word. I want to say the image-based control is uh, very new, in my opinion, very new. I talked with a few uh, professors uh, in control uh, automation. Uh, they said how to control image is something uh, they, <clears throat> not so much research, you can do literature review and uh, also very challenging. But talking about data-driven uh, automation for quality improvements, the image inspection of quality is not uncommon. So what I'd like to say is uh, data-driven automation is uh, effective for in-process quality improvements. This demands new modeling and control methodologies. And there are lots of challenges to do this due to uh, the table I showed early. And we have done some uh, control algorithms follow these uh, concepts, but uh, there are lots of research need to be done. And uh, for each manufacturing process, it's unique for in-process quality improvements and also demands 
unique model and control strategy. Thank you. I don't know if uh, we have time for questions. It's right now o'clock. clock. And yeah. 3 p.m. Okay. We have time for some questions. Uh, any question, please? Yeah. Um, hi, Professor. So I have a question on, uh, so initially you talked about um, multi-stage processes where you, where you said that, say you have a, a multi-stage process, something that goes from, let's say, a door and then to a door socket. I, I don't know the, the technical term for that. But say that there's like a, like a small issue in, in, in the door. Let's say that dimensionally it was made slightly larger. You could correct this by making the, you, by, by changing the size of the door socket. Now, uh, this, is, this is great, but my only question is, say that I bought this car, and then my door broke for some reason, and then I had to replace the door. Um, for this very purpose, would you also have to keep track of the data of, like, the, the, the previous data of my door so that you could produce another door of exactly the same dimensions again? When I say multi-stage manufacturing or automation for conversation, really talking about in the assembly process, if the door dimension is not perfect, Incoming door, not perfect. How can I make an adjustment on the tooling? In this case, is a hinge location, locker striker location, to make the gap flashiness as small as possible. In fact, this kind of automation has been used already uh, 20 years ago in uh, uh, Cadillac and uh, also in Nissan. Uh, they have this intelligent assembly system. So that is the concept. It's not for the Repair, uh, we talk repair of a car. Okay, thank yeah. you. Did I answer a question or some clarification? Um, no, but uh, yeah, I think that's about it. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? Hi, Ben. I have a question. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Jen. This is Peter. Hi, Peter. <clears throat> Long time no see. Hi, yes, Peter. I cannot hear you. Oh, hi, Peter. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Long time no see. One question for you is that how do you see the future of machine learning? and optimization work in synergy? Uh, this is a very important question. Uh, we all know machine learning play more and more important roles. Uh, I think there are two aspects. One is that use machine learning, we can do better job. We can get uh, better estimation, handle massive data. That's one aspect. Another aspect is uh, machine learning can make us can do something cannot accomplished in the past. Uh, it's a, for example, I talk about the fuselage. This is a sparse learning example. I tried physical model modeling of the composite parts. I tried the digital means the design experiments, it all doesn't work. But use this as sparse learning to, to do this uh, automation modeling and control. That's very effective, that's surprisingly uh, effective. So I want to say, uh, the control control guys should learn machine learning as a tool and also image processing, uh, image based control. I, I think this has a very uh, broad future for a control person to, to do further research. In order to handle uh, image data, very high dimension, lots of uh, uh, say images can be available. Use machine learning tools to extract information to get a better model is, uh, I mean, good opportunity for us to do something we cannot do in the past. Yeah. But it's be quite- Thank you very much. <laughs> Great talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think we uh, end the session by this. And once again, uh, big thanks to Professor Xi for this very excellent presentation. Um, there is also a gift for you, uh, but <laughs> uh, we will send that by email or something, yeah.
By mail, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it sounds a little bit strange. Yeah. Okay, uh, so once again, an applaud. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Very appreciate the opportunity. Uh, and um, yeah, the next is, is it coffee break or? Yeah, okay, good, please.